Okay, take out your Bibles, open them up to the book of Daniel. We are making our way through the book of Daniel in our series, Living Godly in a Godless Age. Seeing how this book helps us live in this day and this time that we are in, that is, is, it just seems to be getting worse and worse, doesn't it? But our sure and steady anchor will continue to hold us firm. Continue to hold us firm. Book of Daniel, chapter 2. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 11. It says in your bulletin, I believe, 1 through 19. But as I prepared this week for this message, it kind of turned into a two-parter because there's so much in here. So we're going to be stopping off at verse 11 today and then picking up again next week. So Daniel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And I will ask you, of course, to stand with me in respect to God's word. You get your calisthenics in up here. Up and down. We'll keep you moving. Very good. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And this is what it says. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded all the magi that the magicians, the enchanters and sorcerers and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be, made, be laid ruins. But if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation." They answered and said a second time, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, Tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. You may be seated. That's about how far we're going to make it today. Last time we looked uh, at Daniel a couple weeks ago, since I wasn't here last week, we saw him exemplify what it means to be salt, in the salt of the earth, without being salt in the wound. You remember when he was uh, first taken captive and they were trying to force him to do some things that would defile his conscience? He managed to navigate the situation in such a way, because of the grace of God, because of the favor of God, and because of his own wise behavior, so as not to have to defile himself with the food from the king's table that we saw had been offered to idols and stuff like that, and yet not be a mere irritant to all the people around him because of the way he handled himself. We also saw that because of the way he handled himself and the grace God gave him, that his influence spilled out into the Persian Empire once the Babylonian Empire fell. Because of the wise behavior of this young man and his friends, not only did they survive while they were in this terrible pagan nation that had just destroyed their homeland, they outsurvived the king who brought them in captive, and not only the king, but his entire empire. And Daniel was still there representing the Lord in the king's courts, even after the empire itself was gone. So if you missed uh, that message, you might want to go back and review it. You can go to our website and you can review it there or you can search for our church on YouTube. You'll find it there because I believe that is one of the major keys, one of the most important factors to us being able to live godly in a godless age is knowing how to behave ourselves wisely as Daniel did, by the grace of God. 
This week, we will see the true impact, or we will begin to see the true impact, of Daniel's very wise behavior in interacting with the pagan king in a pagan world that he had been cast into. Well, we'll start to, like I said, because this really, as I prepared, turned into a two-parter, so we will not make it through all the way. We're going to make it today up to the point where Daniel's going to come onto the scene, and we'll really get a good picture of the setting and the world that he is walking into. But this part of the story begins with some dreams. King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, it says. And obviously it's not just talking about your everyday dreams. It's the kind of dreams that really uh, make you set up. They were powerful dreams. They were haunting dreams. The kind of dream that wakes you up in the middle of the night, maybe even in a cold sweat. You ever had a dream do that? Wake you up and you are in a cold sweat and your heart is just going a million miles an hour and you can't get back to sleep. Those were the kinds of dreams that King Nebuchadnezzar was having. I have a recurring dream similar like to that that will set me up in in my bed, and that's it's, it's the one where I come up here to preach and I have nothing to say. You can ask Lisa, that dream has haunted me, and, and uh, it's not as bad now, but in, in years past, and I know part of it's probably because I'm bivocational, because I work a full-time job, and then I come here, and, and there's always that fear that I am not going to be prepared enough, and I'm going to sit up here. Last time I had the dream, it was really scary, because I even had my trusty binder in the dream, and I got up here, and I opened up the binder, and there was nothing in it. It's a terrible dream. And it'll set me up in bed. And then I'm sitting there going, okay, what's today? What's today? Okay, it's Thursday. I'm still okay. That's the kind, I don't know if you had those kind of dreams, but but that's the kind of dream that Nebuchadnezzar was having. And maybe that dream that God gives me is a a gift to you because it keeps me on my toes, right? I'm not just going to coast on through. I'm too afraid to do that. So, um, but Nebuchadnezzar had those kinds of dreams. And they were waking him up in the night, and he couldn't get back to sleep. And the worst thing about those dreams was he couldn't remember them. Have you ever had that kind of a dream? The kind of a dream where you can't remember. Now, it was apparently the same dream over and over again. Because we saw in verse 1 it said, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. But then in verse 3, when he first addresses his magicians and sorcerers and all this, he said, I had, you see it there, a dream. So he is here having this dream repeatedly, a dream that wakes him up in the middle of the night, sits him up in bed, cold sweats and all that, and he can't get back to sleep. And it's the same dream over and over again. And the hard part is he can't remember it. He knows there's something there. There had to be something. And and it bothered him that he couldn't remember it. He could not recount the dream. You know how it is when you know there's something you're supposed to remember and you can't remember it? And it's right there, right just outside your grasp. And you know, I can almost remember. It happens to me when I go to the store for Lisa. And I'm looking at all these things on the shelves. And I'm like, I'm supposed to get something. (laughs) That's why I ask her now. She's like, will you go to the store and get this? What do I say? text me (laughs) because I want to be able to look at my phone when I get there and cannot remember why in the why in the world I'm at the store I know I got to get something I know it's important and I don't know what so I have two choices I have her text me otherwise I can run around the store for hours until I remember till something stirs the memory or I can just buy everything and hope I get the right thing the shotgun approach that gets expensive but And usually even then I come home without the thing. Well, you got this, you got this, you got this. Where's the mayonnaise? I'll be back. (laughs) You have those thoughts and they're right there and you just can't remember them. And that's the way this dream was for Nebuchadnezzar. He's sitting there in bed and it's haunting him. And he's like, but I can't tell what it is. He knows, just like when I'm having those moments, that maybe I have to start having her text me when I go into the next room, because I know I did that yesterday. I was here at the church working on some things, and I came upstairs, and I was like, why did I come upstairs? (laughs) Text myself before I go. But, you know, uh, he's trying to remember this thing, and, and he just can't, and he knows he will remember it when something stirs the memory, 
but it's just driving him nuts. Nagging feeling. They're just out of reach, and he couldn't remember the dream. Well, the dream was a prophetic dream. Not pathetic, prophetic. It was a prophetic dream. And you know what is really surprising about that? This dream that he had, it's a, it's a dream of prophecy. It's about what's coming up. This dream was a dream given by God. And it is really the cornerstone dream of all prophecies. The, the cornerstone of all the prophecies is this dream. And all the other uh, prophecies line up with this. And you know what is so surprising about this dream? That God gave it to Nebuchadnezzar. The pagan king. The king who had just, just d destroyed Judah. Overrun Jerusalem. The king who had just brought all these young boys back here to corrupt them and to turn them into good little Babylonians instead of good little Jewish worshipers of God. And God saw fit in his eternal wisdom to give the keystone vision of all Bible prophecy to this pagan king. Didn't give it to Daniel. Didn't give it to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Samuel, any of the Moses, any of the great ones. Gave it to the pagan king. To the king who accredited his gods, small g's, with the victory uh, over Jerusalem. He said, my gods did this. And he took the articles he took from the temple and he put them on display. We talked about that in his temple to honor his gods for their victory over Jehovah. Hmm. Does it seem right to you that God did that instead of giving it to one of the prophets of God? It does show us one thing, and I've told you about this. I've mentioned this a couple times as we go through this series, that God is in serious pursuit of this man, Nebuchadnezzar and his soul. And we will see it. It will continue to develop. And this is one of the first big steps. But God is in serious pursuit of the soul of this man, this King Nebuchadnezzar. And it also shows us this, and it also falls into place because of this, because God has always had a heart for the Gentile world. He wasn't just always about the Jews. His plan was always to redeem the Gentiles, and we'll see that more. And because of all this going on, we see a serious swing, a huge swing that happens here in, in the book of Daniel. And it's, it's totally worth noting. It, it's invisible on the surface, but it's in there. Uh, first part of it we see because he gave this dream to this pagan Gentile king. And then this swing happens uh, in, in Lisa's company. They call it a pivot. Her company is always doing this. They're working in this direction, and all of a sudden they change, and they start working in this direction. We see God do a major pivot like this in the Bible, and it happens. It's kind of hidden in the language, but it's there. The book of Daniel switches its focus and the focus of the Bible at this point away from the nation of Israel and sets its focus on God's plan for the entire Gentile world. It pivots. Most of the prophecies of the Old Testament, you can read them and you know this, except for a very few, like the book of Obadiah, book of Nahum, a couple of them refer to Gentiles. But most of the book, overwhelmingly, of the Old Testament prophetic books refer to Israel and Judah, and, and the prophecies all have to do with them. But God's plan of redemption has always been for the whole world and not for just Israel. He set Israel apart as, uh, the reason he focuses on them so much is he set them apart as a witness to the rest of the world. That was the point of setting aside these people. He says, you will be my witness. In fact, I'll show you where in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 9 and 10. Turn there with me. I'm going to have you do some turning. Keep your fingers uh, limbered up and ready to go this morning. Hear those pages turning. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 9 and 10. And once we get done with this, don't flip away too fast because there's another point here. 
But this is what God says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 9 and 10. He says, All the nations gather together, and all the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Who can tell us about the things of old? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right, and let them hear and say it is true. He's saying, All you have your beliefs, you believe what you, you have your religions, all of you around the world, you bring them to me, you testify, and you show me what is true. Then he continues down here with a challenge next. He says to Israel, you are my witnesses. I call all these other nations to come and give witness about their gods and what they believe and how they think the world came into being. He turns to Israel and said, but you are my witnesses. I'm calling you forward to give witness and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. His whole point of Israel in setting this people, this people aside was that they would be a witness to the world that he is God. He is creator. He is the only God. That is his point for setting them aside. If you look down at verse 14 right there, it's interesting because this is about 100 years before Babylon, the great nation, ever uh, really got mentioned. In verse 14 there, in that same, those same set of verses, he says, For your sake I send to Babylon. And I bring them all down as fugitives, even to the Chaldeans. He mentions the Chaldeans and the Babylonians before they were ever players in the world. This was written a hundred years before Daniel. This was written way back where we started when King Hezekiah decided he would show off all his goods to this little nothing country over here called Babylon, way far away, 900 miles away. Nothing to worry about. I can show off to them. And here... They're mentioned in that same thing. As we see the focus pivoting from just being on Israel to being on the whole Gentile word. God, world, excuse me. God gives the dream of all dreams to a pagan Gentile king. It shows up in the language, too, of the passage. Um, we know this. The Old Testament was written primarily in what language? Can anybody answer that? Do you know? What was that? Nope, that's the New Testament. New Testament is written in Greek primarily, correct, and, and completely. Hebrew, exactly. There we go. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, all except for a couple small parts. Did you know that? We always think it's all written in Hebrew, but there's a couple small parts that are not written in Hebrew. Part of the book of Daniel and a small part of the book of Ezra are written in a language called Aramaic. You've heard of Aramaic? How many have heard of Aramaic? Aramaic was kind of the Gentile tongue of the day. It's what the whole world spoke. So if you wanted to address all of the Gentile world, all of the nations of the world, you would address them at that time in the language of Aramaic. It was still spoken in the time of Jesus. We see how many times where it says in the Aramaic tongue, it was this. It was the common vernacular of the Gentile world at that time. It was the common language. Later, it would be Greek, and that's when the New Testament was written. Well, actually, the New Testament was written later, but it was still Greek at that point. And then later, it would become Latin, when Rome was the power of the world, and that became the language of the whole world. I studied Latin in junior high, and, and it really helped me with English, but... Uh, one of the main things I remember about Latin was the poem we learned, you know, Latin is a language, it's dead as dead can be, it killed off all the Romans and now it's killing me. <laughs> but at one point, that was the common language of the whole world and that's why so many things were written in Latin at that time. During Daniel's time, the common language was Aramaic, the Gentile tongue. The Bible... At the same time as God gave this dream to Nebuchadnezzar, this book of Daniel switches from Hebrew to Aramaic, to the Gentile tongue. It's kind of funny when you look at the writing, because it's in verse 4 there is where it switches, and it says, Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, and the funny thing is, is when it says in Aramaic, it switches to Aramaic at that point. 
and it stays in Aramaic, the, the Gentile tongue at that time, instead of being all things Hebrew, it switches to the Gentile world at that time. And in Aramaic, it continues till chapter 7, where Daniel introduces, his, uh, introduces us to Jesus' favorite name for himself. Can you remember what that name was? Did I hear it? Anyone? I've shared it with you. What was Jesus' favorite term to refer to himself? Son of man. And that we will see in chapter 7. And that is the point then where it switches back to Hebrew. So all the time between now, when he is dealing with King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he is, it is, has such a worldwide focus that has switched language from the Hebrew sacred language of Scripture to Aramaic. All that to say, God was always focused on the whole world. And here he brings this dream to the pagan king, the Gentile king, and he shows him his plan. We'll talk more about what the dream is next week. Nebuchadnezzar thought he had invaded Jerusalem, but the truth is God had invaded Nebuchadnezzar's life and his palace, and he had put the people he wanted in the places he wanted to see his plan for the ages revealed, just like playing chess and you get to checkmate. God has all his pieces in the right places, and now he's making his move, and now it comes into play. In his distress over his dream, Nebuchadnezzar turned to the only thing he knew to find answers. Who did he turn to? Look at verse 2. The Chaldeans, that's one of them. Yep, several groups here named Chaldeans, sorcerers, magicians, enchanters. This is who he turned to for his answers. These were practices that were totally ingrained in his culture. Might I say they are way too ingrained in our culture today as well. And it's actually growing you can go to Google and type in, is paganism increasing in the United States? And you're going to get overwhelmed with a response that says, yes. People are not uh, embarrassed to call themselves pagans these days. It's growing here in the United States. It is way too big in our own culture. Horoscopes, tarot cards, Ouija boards, palm readers, you name it. And people all around us are, are using these things. Just yesterday, Lisa and I were, I said, we were up here at the church working for a little while and driving home from the church, going down 31, we saw this billboard and it just caught my eye and it said on it, Gypsy Goddess Festival. It's right down there. It's, it's all around us. Uh, there's a, a place right near our house that practices Reiki and it's a way of uh, channeling spiritual energy through uh, massage and treatment into your body and, and bringing healing and stuff like that. And these are all practices that are going right on in our world, not just the world. You don't have to go to California to get this stuff, folks. The Gypsy Goddess Festival is coming to you. It's part of the world we live in. And if we're going to live godly in a godless age, we kind of have to understand these things, don't we? We can kind of chuckle, and sometimes we talk about crystal gazers and people that will hold a stone, and they're sitting there gazing into that for the, the, the stone to speak to them. But it's real, and it's going on. People use these things to guide their lives. There are people who won't make a decision without consulting their horoscope in the newspaper. Why is it that we are here in the 21st century? And if you get the newspaper, it still has this horoscope in it. If you go to your landing page where you get your news on the internet, I would just about bet you there's a part there that has your horoscope in it. People are looking to these things to give them guidance in life. There's a hunger for something spiritual in the world around us. Spirituality, not religion. They don't want to say religion, do they? I'm not a religious person. I'm spiritual. Right? That's the kind of thing people will say. Because there's a part of us that knows there is more to the universe than we can see and hear and feel and smell. Everyone knows that inside their being. God put that there so you would know it. 
Some people even call that thing God, probably with a small g, but they will call that thing they know out there is God, and I can't really define him, but I can use these things to try and find him or to hear from him. They'll talk about the universe itself. There used to be pantheism where everything is, you know, where there's all these gods and everything is God. Now one of the big movements that is creeping into parts of Christianity even is called panentheism. Have you heard of that? where God is present in the whole universe, so as I worship the universe, I am actually worshiping God. Wrong. There is one God. And he is greater than you, the universe. And apart from it, people will talk about karma. Well, that's good karma. That's bad karma. And they will try and use these things to live in this balance with the universe, to have a good life. And they will use all these kind of things like we're talking about to try and reach out into that spiritual realm and find the answers. And they believe that any way you reach out to God is okay, but it's not. There is one God. And one mediator between God and man. What does it say? Can you finish that verse? The man, Christ Jesus. There's the answer. There's not every way to reach God. One God, one way. He has reached out and he has revealed himself to us through the ages And these revelations of himself were written down and they were kept safe for us. And we recall and we call these things in these revelations what? The word of God. The Bible. He has revealed himself to us and we have it recorded and and preserved for us. He revealed himself to people through, and eventually he revealed himself through what way? Hebrews 1, yeah, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Turn there with me. Look at this verse. There's a very specific way God has revealed himself to man. And there is a final way he has revealed himself to us. The writer of the Hebrews writes that long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And in these last days, he has spoken to us how? By his... It's right up there on the screen. Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. God has revealed himself through history, through the prophets, through these things, and they were all recorded for us. And finally, he became that revelation and came to this world and lived amongst us so we could, uh, so he could speak to us and show himself to us. He has been revealing himself to us from the beginning but in a very concrete and solid way, is concerning how many people are willing to have a sense of spirituality but are not willing to believe in the God of the Bible. That's the world we live in. They turn to these things to hear from God, and they won't turn uh, to the very book he gave us through which he clearly revealed himself to us. He revealed himself through many writers and prophets and through history and things he interacted with man. He has shown us his character over and over again. 1,400 years worth of writing, 40 different authors, three different continents, one story cover to cover. His love for us and his redeeming uh, plan through Jesus Christ. Paganism is on the rise, though. Beware of these things. Beware of them. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here this morning, but you know, you may very well have someone in your life that is dabbling in these things, if, if you yourself are not. I hope you're not. If you are, forsake it. If you know somebody who is, pray for them, warn them, do whatever you have to. Be, but you need to know about these things, because they are going on. Could be a coworker, children, grandchildren, just tuning into their favorite web page and reading their horoscope every day. But this stuff is real. It's not just a harmless game. It's going on and it's, it's gaining acceptance around the world even as true Christianity is becoming less and less acceptable. I want you to know that God cl- plainly condemns the practice of these things. 
Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 through 14. God is very clear on these things. They're not things to be toyed with or played with. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Just before Israel goes into the promised land, God is laying down his law one more time. That's what Deuteronomy means, repeating the law. So he is repeating it through Moses here, and he tells them, gives them these final marching orders before they go in. He says, There shall not be found among you any who burns his son or daughter as an offering. Anyone, he says, now we get into these real things, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, that's somebody who speaks to the dead, or one who inquires of the dead, that would be seances. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. Why does God say he's driving the, the, other, the Canaanites out? Because of their practice of these things. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and diviners, but as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. He clearly condemns it. Some people would say, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, he says it's an abomination. Did it stop being an abomination just because we're not under the law anymore? No. Do not play with things like palm readings, astrology, tarot cards. Have nothing to do. It's, it's sad I've heard of a Christian group that has even made like Christian tarot cards to try and hear from God. Really? What a compromise. Do not be involved in those things. If you, if you have any of those in your past, I would recommend what they did in the city of Ephesus when they accepted Christ. Turn with me to Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 20. It went on, not just in the days of Moses, even when Paul was going out into the world, these same magic arts were being practiced. And Paul went into Ephesus, and he began to preach, and they accepted Christ. And this is what it says in Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 18. It says, Also many of those who were now believers came, so they had accepted Christ, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. They brought all these things, these magic arts they had been using, and they burned them in the town square, and it equaled 50,000 pieces of silver. And it says, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. 50,000 pieces of silver, we don't know exactly how much that money was, uh, but we know this, Judas betrayed Jesus for how many? 30. That is almost 1,700 times as much as Judas was paid to betray Jesus. They had accumulated that much money, that much wealth, that much material and paraphernalia in their magic arts, in the astrology, in the sorcery, in the card readings, whatever they were doing. I did notice as I was looking uh, at what's going on in our area, and I looked at the Reiki shop bias where they were practicing, they practiced that mystical art just over near our house. And the first thing I see is when you go in, they want to sell you paraphernalia. Well, here they had 50,000 pieces of silver, millions of dollars worth. And when they turned to the Lord, they brought it, they abandoned it, they burned it, and look at the results. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. That's how we have to treat these things. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 47, verses 12 through 14. I think that's the last time I'll make you turn this morning. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 12 through 14. Isaiah 47, verse 12, starting there, says this. 
Stand fast in your enchantments. If you want to practice these things, he says, do. You want to trust in them, do. He says, and your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. You've been practicing this from your youth. You've been living with these cultic practices. He says, perhaps you may be able to succeed. Perhaps you may inspire terror. You are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you. And let me reemphasize that. Let them stand forth and save you. Those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, there's your astrologers, who at the new moons make known what shall come upon you. This is clearly astrology, and people are following this. He says, you want to trust in that? You trust in that. You go ahead. He says, behold, though, those things, they are like stubble. The fire consumes them. They cannot deliver themselves for the power, from the power of the flame. No coal for warming oneself is this. No fire to sit before. There is no comfort. There is no power. There is nothing you need in these things. They are empty. They are lies of Satan. They are tricks of the devil. Don't fall for them. And if you put your trust in them, you will be disappointed. That's what he is saying there. These things are an abomination to God, and they cannot save you. And that is the, that last part there is what Nebuchadnezzar is just about to realize as he is in his palace, and he has summoned all these enchanters and all these sorcerers and all these astrologers to come in and share with him his dream. He turned to them, and he will find that they cannot save you. He calls his magicians, and he asks them to tell him his dream, not just the interpretation, not just to interpret it, but to tell them what the dream was because he can't remember it. And the magicians say, O oh, king, live forever. That's a good way to go in, right? They butter the bread as they come on in. O oh, king, live forever. What is it you want? Tell your servants the dream. We, you are a great king and we just want to honor you. Tell us the dream and we'll show you the interpretation. It's like, you know, if you call that one of the dial a psychic numbers, which I never want you to do, and they ask you who it is, you probably should hang up right away. They ought to know, right? <laughs> Same thing's going on here with them. He's like, you guys are supposed to be these psychics. Tell me everything I need to know. You should already know this. King Nebuchadnezzar in this proves himself to be very shrewd and also very severe. He's not a man to be trifled with. He says, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb. Not a good day. And your houses shall be laid in ruins. You guys have been telling me all along that you have the power, you have this supernatural power. You led, and, and it's probably got somewhat to do with, I think these guys probably led his father, because this is, if you look at verse 1, this is the second year of his reign. He's just come to the throne. These are probably all the guys that his father listened to and, and had all the counsel with his father. So he's saying, if you guys are really going to help me lead my kingdom, you better prove yourself right now. And if you can't, I will rip you to shreds. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. That is really laying it all on the table. We read that verse last night, and Lisa's like, I'll just pass. And it's like, he didn't give him that option. Tell me or die painfully. But if you do tell me, I'll reward you. He wants to know that these so-called wise men that have been feeding him all this garbage all this time are really worth what they say they are. He wants proof. And you know what? Just like it said in Isaiah, they can't give it. They can't give it. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dreams and we'll show you the interpretation. Meet us in the middle, king. You tell us and we'll tell you. How's that sound to you? And King Nebuchadnezzar says, I know with certainty you are trying to gain time. You're buying time. You're trying to come up with something. You're stalling is what he says to him. We'll see when we get into this next week that when it comes to Daniel, where these guys were buying time, it says Daniel set a time. I'll remind you of that last week because he had faith in his God. Just give me an appointment. I'll come in and tell you. They were buying time at this point. 
If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words. You can see how he trusts them before me till time changes. Times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can. Uh, I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. And then the magician said the one true thing that they could have said. There's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. That's the one true thing they probably said to him. Uh, you're a demanding king. Uh, you know, they even say, they try and reason with him for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing. Nobody else, Pharaoh never asked of this. Uh, uh, the Assyrian king never asked of this. Nobody reasonable, King Nebuchadnezzar, has ever asked any man to share with him a dream he had alone in his room with nobody there and he can't remember himself. It's the truest thing they ever said. And then they said, the king, what the king asked is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except, and they were close on this one, they say, except the gods. Too bad they went with a small g and put an s on the end, isn't it? Because they're kind of on the right track. They said, the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. They were kind of close. The only one, the truth is the only one who could share the dream that God had given Nebuchadnezzar was the God who gave it. And that would be the proof. What these men had to offer him was simply speculative and false. And this is where Daniel comes in. But we are out of time. Part of living godly in a godless age is knowing how to spot the truth. That is what we can get from this. Living godly in a godless age is going to require that we can spot the truth. Whatever the world tells us, especially in these days of plurality, and we live in a pluralistic society where it's okay, any religion you want is okay as long as your religion doesn't say that the other religions are wrong. That's the one thing you can't say in our world. They are willing to accept anything except that. But we live in this pluralistic society, and what we have to know is that there is a truth, and there is one source of truth, and that source of truth is what? Tell me. It's the Bible. It is that one source of truth. I am so glad that God has revealed himself to us in a way that is lasting and consistent and solid and unchanging. I love that I can go at home. I have a Bible that is from like 1850. And you know what I love about it? I mean, it's falling apart, but I love it and I keep it because the words in it are the same as the words in this. Because his word is not changing. You can go all the way back through history and find his words are not changing. He has given us his word and it is solid and it is true and it is trustworthy. Exactly the opposite of these men that King Nebuchadnezzar brought in. And there is nowhere else we need to turn. We have that source of truth. We don't have to turn to tarot cards or tea leaves or anything like that because we have the source of truth that God has given us. And we should be every day anxious to look into that word. Some people are so anxious to get to their horoscope in the morning to see how their day is going to go. We should be so anxious to just hit our Bibles and look in and say, this is the word that God has given me. And it has everything I need.